Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost comes from our Old Testament reading of Genesis. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. In the name of Jesus. This is the second week in a row that we read about two brothers, seemingly murderous animosity that rises up between them. Last week it was Jacob and it was Esau. But the one thing that I forgot to mention that time was that by the time of our reading of our text, after Jacob had wrestled with God and God had allowed him to win, after God had blessed Jacob with a new name and a new identity in him, Esau then comes the very next day to meet with Jacob. And there he is, standing there with his 400 men of war. And Jacob is sure that his time here on earth is coming to an end, knowing that he won't have the strength to fight after a night wrestling with the Almighty and his hip out of joint and all. But surprise of all surprises, Esau, he runs as fast as he can to Jacob and he embraces him and he hugs him, and he kisses him, and forgives him everything before Jacob ever had the chance to even ask for it. Imagine that. After all that Jacob had done to Esau, the gospel and the forgiveness of sins still wins the day. Amazing. If you remember from last week, we found Christ there. Yes, even there, all the way back in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. So let's even go further back in Genesis to chapter 4. And let's see if we can find Christ there. And we all know the story. Cain, he's a farmer and works the soil. Abel, he's a shepherd and tends the flock. And one day they both come to offer a sacrifice to God. But only one brother's sacrifice is acceptable. And that's Abel's. God had no regard for Cain's offering and sacrifice, wanted nothing to do with it. Now, a lot has been said about the two different types of sacrifices that were offered. Cain, he brought fruit and vegetables, maybe some broccoli and cabbage and a bushel full of apples, certainly no persimmons. But Abel brought the firstborn of his flock, but the fattiest most marbled cut of New York Strip that you've ever seen. Now, I would like to say that God didn't like Cain's offering because God isn't a vegetarian, but I'm probably wrong about that. Certainly, something could be said, of course, about the firstborn from the flock sort of stuff and the fact that a living thing had to sacrifice its life in Abel's offering. And yes, I think there is some truth to be told there, some foreshadowing to be found. But if we only let it stand there, then we're going to have a problem, I think. Because if we just get bogged down into the different types of sacrifices, then we're going to start thinking that certain sacrifices that are brought, that maybe even we bring before our Lord, are inherently better than others because of what they are. Switch the offerings in our text. Have Cain bring the meat and Abel the veggies, and Abel will still be the one acceptable in God's sight. And I know all of that's a little hard to understand, like when Jesus talks about that widow's mite being the most valuable offering around. So we're just going to have to take God's word for it. You see, the problem isn't that Cain offered fruit. It's that his offering was fruitless. If you flip to the 11th chapter of Hebrews, you get to see God talking about this. That he has regard for Abel and his offering because it was brought in faith. Now, certainly Cain's offering was brought in faith as well, but it was different. Because remember, we've spoken about faith before. Faith is nothing in and of itself. What's important is not faith, but the object of that faith faith. And so, yes, Cain had faith. And yes, he brought an offering in faith. It was just that his faith was placed in the wrong thing. 
Now, the first verse of our text for today tells us that Eve bore a son, and that son was Cain. And when she had given birth, she said, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. That's what our English says. Now, this is one of those times in which our English does the best it can, but it still falls short. And Hebrew scholars will tell us, which I am not one of them, so I have to rely on others like Luther, but they'll say that a phrase like this is probably better translated as, I have begotten a man, namely the Lord. You see, Eve thought that she had given birth to the Messiah. And who could really blame her? She's only parodying what she had heard from the Lord him, himself back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God declares that Satan will be defeated by the fruit of her womb. The thing is, the Messiah will come from her offspring, all right. He's just going to come centuries later than she expected. Poor Cain, he isn't the Messiah, although he thinks he is. And again, I kind of feel sorry for him. Because this is what he had been told since he was a little boy. And so when he comes to bring his offering before the Lord, his faith isn't in God and his gracious mercy, but it's in himself. Cain thinks that his offering will be acceptable to God because it comes from him. He thinks that he's actually offering God something. He thinks that he's righteous in and of himself. He thinks that God will look upon him with a big old smile and say, Thank you, Cain, for this great and abundant harvest. I accept it all because of how good you are. And in that way, Cain is no different than the Pharisee in our gospel reading who pompously strides into the temple and is so sure of his own righteousness that he has the audacity to offer a prayer of thanks. And that prayer of thanks says that he's happy that he doesn't have to rely on anyone else for righteousness. Cain, like the Pharisee, is thankful that he doesn't have to look outside of himself for salvation. Not like his brother Abel. Not like the sinful tax collector with his face in the dirt, pleading for mercy from God. No, Cain is sure that he doesn't need mercy, doesn't need grace. He doesn't need anything from the hand of God. God will accept him and his sacrifice because Cain is good. The only problem is, he isn't. And in that way, Cain is like every other self-righteous sinner who's ever walked the face of the planet. Which is to say, Cain is no different than anyone else. Cain's no different than you or me. For the self-righteous sinner in all of us is convinced that we can offer something to God and that God will accept it for our sake. The self-righteous sinner is sure that he needs nothing and no one outside of him because he's just so darn righteous. The self-righteous sinner, the Cain in all of us, the Pharisee in each and every single one of us, is thankful and sure and confident that we can be our own Savior, our own Messiah, that we don't need another, that we don't need to be saved, that we don't need God himself to be our Savior. And the author of the book of Hebrews tells us that Abel and his sacrifice is acceptable to God because it is offered in faith, which means this, that it's offered in a faith that says, I'm nothing. I stand before you as a poor, miserable sinner who can't offer you anything, God. Nothing good can come from me. I need it all to come from you. I'm lost and I'm dead and I'm condemned without you. I need a savior because I can't save myself. I need you, God, to do it all for me. I need you to make me righteous. I need you to offer, offer the sacrifice that will save me. I need you to do it all and everything because I'm nothing more than a tax collector standing in the corner too ashamed to lift up my sinful eyes to heaven, pleading, begging, knowing that I don't deserve the mercy that I'm asking 
but knowing for sure that I'll receive it because you've promised so. But Cain, he refuses to have a faith like that. And many still do. And so God, he comes and he seeks out Cain. Because that's what God does, always. He seeks out the sinner. And God, he asks Cain a question. He doesn't come thundering with the law, promising to destroy him. For God doesn't desire the death of a sinner, but that all would come to the knowledge of salvation and live. So God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And again, the English doesn't do this justice because God isn't putting forth some sort of moralism here, telling Cain that he just has to do better to be accepted by God. No, God uses the very same exact word that he did when he created the whole world. Tov, which means good, goodly good, divinely good, perfectly good. If Cain is that sort of good, then he will be accepted. But Cain can't be that sort of good. No sinner can, not in and of himself. We all know that. And so what God is saying is Cain Stop looking inside of you. Stop thinking that you can save yourself. Stop having faith in Cain. And instead, look to the only one who is good. Look to me. Have faith in me. I will make you good. I will make your offerings and you yourself acceptable in my sight because I will be your Messiah, your Savior, your righteousness. But Cain refuses to believe this. And the self-righteous sinner always does. He refuses to believe that he can't save himself. He refuses to believe that God smiles upon those who fall on their face to the ground and plead for mercy. He refuses to believe that God would be happy with someone who can't be his own savior. And so Cain, he goes out and he finds his brother, his weak, little, miserable brother, who relies on God for righteousness and holiness and goodness and salvation, and he kills him. Isn't it amazing how little time it takes for the full effect of sin to actually be manifest in the world? The wages of sin is death. And already, just one chapter after the fall, and we see this, We're bearing witness to the very first murder that takes place. It doesn't take that long. And that should be a warning to all of us that when sin lives freely inside of us and when we place our trust in ourselves, any of us can be capable of the most horrible things imaginable. And yet God still comes to Cain with patience wanting desperately to grant grace and mercy and every blessing, even after this most egregious sin has been committed. And so God comes asking a question again. He wants Cain to see his sin. He wants Cain to realize who he is, that he isn't the Savior of the world because the Savior comes to bring life, not death. Where's your brother, Cain? Don't you see it? Can't you understand even now that you're not righteous and holy and blameless? That you can't save yourself? How are you supposed to be the Messiah when you can't even be your own Savior? And Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? The sinner in Cain still refuses to believe that he's a sinner. And it's at this point where I would like to think that I'm better than Cain, but left to my own devices, I'll always refuse to confess the sinner that I am. But God is still the merciful God that he always is. Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, Cain. I know what you've done. I know the sinner that you are, but believe it or not, my grace is still for you. My mercy and my forgiveness is still for you. 
You can still be righteous, but that righteousness will never come from you. Look at what you've done. Stop thinking that you're good in and of yourself. You aren't. But you are in me. I can and I will make you righteous. The Messiah is coming. He's promised for you. You just aren't him. All of us are like Cain. All of our sins are laid before God. The metaphorical, or maybe even for some of us, the real blood of our brothers is calling out from the ground, bearing witness to the things that we've done and to all of the sins that we've committed. Nothing is hidden from our God's eyes. We can't use the law to justify ourselves. And we can't hope to bring an acceptable sacrifice before him, no matter how choice and perfect we think it actually is. We can't offer him anything, nothing to take away those sins and quiet the cries of those that we've sinned against. Don't look to yourself for salvation. Don't put trust in your own righteousness. That will only lead you down the unbelieving road of Cain, Come in faith before your God, like the miserable tax collector that you are. Stop with the misconceived notion that you don't need a Savior and call out to God for his mercy. He won't delay in giving it. In fact, that's all he ever wants to do. And he will always keep seeking you out, never tire in doing so. His mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, his righteousness is always there for you. Because there's another man's blood that's calling out from the ground and is passing through the heavens to fall on the ears of God. And that man's blood is not calling out for your judgment. And it's not calling out to say how much of a horrible sinner you are and that God should pour out his righteous wrath upon you. In fact, it's saying the exact opposite. The blood of Jesus that pooled to the ground right below that cross 2,000 years ago, is crying out to God, saying, that one is forgiven, and that one is righteous, and that one's sins have been covered and atoned for and taken away forever. And the proof of all of it is that my blood was shed upon that one's sins and upon his head and poured down his belly I'm that sinner's Savior. Yes, Cain's Savior. And Joe's Savior. And Rachel's Savior. And Joanna's Savior. And Salem's Savior. And everyone who sits here this morning, I am their Savior. My blood cries out to bear witness to it. They are acceptable to you, Father in heaven. I've made them acceptable. Because I'm their righteousness. I'm their Savior. And there it is, brothers and sisters in Christ. We did it. We found Jesus. Even all the way back in the fourth chapter of Genesis. Jesus for you. Jesus for Cain. Jesus for the sinner. For each and every single sinner. Jesus. Your brother's blood crying out from the ground for your salvation. In the name of Jesus.